Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Applications of Field Flow Fractionation in Drug Delivery Analysis. I'm Laura Bush, the Editorial Director of LCGC, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're pleased to bring you this webcast presented by LCGC and sponsored by PostNova Analytics. PostNova Analytics is the leading manufacturer of field flow fractionation instruments for separation and characterization of drug delivery systems, nanoparticles, proteins, polymers, and more. Field flow fractionation coupled to multi-angle light scattering and other detectors provides high resolution size and molar mass separation, characterization, and elemental quantification. Before we get started today, we have a few housekeeping announcements. First, the webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions. You can submit questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box and you can find that on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the webcast. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation today, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your window. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. We are very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Sohail Tajiki. Dr. Sohail Tajiki earned his PhD from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, where he specialized in field flow fractionation. He joined PostNova Analytics in 2001 and is now the Managing Director of the USA office. Dr. Tajiki, thank you for joining us today. Please get us started. Hello, this is Sohail Tajiki of PostNova Analytics. Today we will be exploring the use of field flow fractionation, or FFF, for characterization of various drug delivery systems. I will give a short introduction on the basic principle of FFF then discuss a variety of different applications which can be addressed by this versatile family of techniques. Since 1970, the US FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research has received more than 600 applications for human drug products containing nanomaterials. This graph from a report by the US FDA in July 2020 illustrates a number of submissions received. These are further classified as abbreviated new drug application, new drug application, and investigation of the new drug. Half of the 600 applications containing nanomaterials were submitted within the last 10 years. In recent years, the pharmaceutical industry has seen an increase in use of biomacromolecules for treatments. Antibodies, viruses, and nanoparticles can all be used either directly as medicine or agents of drug delivery for small molecules. Monoclonal antibodies, a specific type of antibody, are being developed for treatment of a range of diseases, including cancer, autoimmune disease, and Alzheimer disease. Viruses and virus-like particles contain promise for delivering of gene therapy to replace or deactivate a mutated gene or insert a new gene to fight disease. Among other conditions, viral vectors for gene therapy are being investigated for treatment of Parkinson's disease, cytic uh, fibrosis, and congestive heart failure. Nanomedicine can take many forms, but in general, consists of particles ranging of diameters from a few nanometers to several hundred nanometers, which can deliver drugs or genes and provide internal imaging. Nanomedicine aims to improve treatment in regenerative medicine or to aid recovery from stroke or multiple sclerosis and deliver drugs to selectively attack cancer cells. What analytical instruments provide useful characterization data for biopharmaceutical and nanomedicine products? One of the most important critical quality attributes for particles on the nanoscale is their size distribution. A few of the most common methods for determining particle size are shown here. Electromicroscopy, 
dynamic light scattering, and side scrutching chromatography. It is always nice to see your particles, and electron microscopy is great for that. In addition, you can get data on size and shape from the images. The downside is that it is expensive, labor-intensive, and developing size distribution for a large number of samples is practically prohibited. Dynamic light scattering is less expensive, easy to use, and much faster, typically delivering results on particle size in minutes. However, larger particles scatter light much more intensely than a small, smaller particles. So polydispersed samples, for example, when virus or antibody aggregates are present, will likely produce DLS results that are not indic indicative of the real size distribution. To combat this effect, for polydispersed samples, separation techniques can be used. Size exclusion chromatography uses a stationary phase to separate samples by size and has the effluent pass through a variety of detectors, including light scattering, to accurately measure size. Unfortunately, many biopharmaceutical products, such as virus aggregates and liposomes, may be larger than the maximum size we can effectively separate using size exclusion chromatography. One technique that is com complementary to all these techniques is field flow fractionation, or FFF. Field flow fractionation does not use a packed column for separation. The column chromatography technique, which most commonly gets compared with FFF is side exclusion chromatography, or SEC. Here we see a graphic comparison of the two techniques, which helps explain why FFF is generally much more useful for separating large particles. In SEC, the column is filled with a porous packing material, which smaller particles are likely to diffuse into and cause them to take a longer route through the column, while larger particles can bypass the pores and elute faster. Therefore, with SEC, we observe a size separation with large particles followed by smaller particles. In the FFF, the separation principle is different. The name is a good descriptor for, what, for how it works. You have a field perpendicular to a channel flow, and the combination of these results in fractionation. There are a number of subtypes of FFF, but they all share the same general working principle, as shown on the bottom schematic. The separation occurs in a long, thin, open channel, which is typically 10 to 30 centimeters long, but only a few hundred microns thick. The liquid flow through the channel is parabolic, so it is very slow along the channel top and bottom, and much faster in the center of the channel. When a sample is injected into the channel, the field pushes the particles toward the channel bottom, where the flow is very slow. Depending on the type of the field, particles with smaller size or lower mass will diffuse more readily into the faster flow profiles closer to the channel center, and travel down the channel and elude the detectors more quickly. Larger or massive particles will, will be kept in the slower flows during separation and be eluted later. So the elution order is the opposite of SEC. FFF eludes small particles first and larger particles later. Since there is no stationary phase, it also has the additional advantage of being a low pressure and low shear technique, which is commonly referred to as a gentle separation. This can be important for preserving and accurately characterizing aggregates and agglomerates. One of the specific subtypes of FFF is asymmetrical flow FFF, often referred to as AF4. It is very versatile, as it separates by size from, from about one nanometer up to the microns range. In the case of AF4, the field is what we call the cross-flow field, and is generated by pumping liquid across a membrane on the channel bottom. During elution, we have two flows in effect the channel flow, and the cross flow. Smaller particles can more readily diffuse against the cross flow into faster flow profiles and allow the detectors earlier than larger particles.
In addition to cross flow in EAF4, electrical field can be applied for separation of charge biologics. The effect of electric field is relatively small compared to the flow field, so this technique primarily separates by size. However, when analyzing a charged particle, protein, or polymer, multiple run conditions can be used with varying electric field. The shift in retention time due to the electric field allows measurement of electrophoretic mobility, and from that, the zeta potential can be calculated. AF4 and EAF4 can separate particles with about a 30% or greater difference in size, from about 1 nanometer up to the low micron range. FFF theory has been well studied since invention, and we can quite accurately relate the retention time to either dynamic size. If the separation parameters such as temperature, channel dimensions, and flow rates are well known. Another subtype of FFF is centrifugal FFF or CF3. It has also been commonly called sedimentation FFF in the literature. This technique separates particles by mass instead of size and is very useful for high density materials like metal or metal oxide nanoparticles. Again, we can relate the retention time to a particle size. In this case, we also need to know the material density and assume a particle geometry. To generate the field, the FFF channel is placed in a centrifuge rotor like a belt and span. The channel is made of two non-porous stainless steel rings with no membrane inside. The field strain is controlled by adjusting the rotational speed of the centrifuge rotor. The centrifugal field forces particles to the channel bottom, where the channel flow is slow. And less massive particles can more readily diffuse against the centrifugal force to enter the faster channel flows. So in this case, we see a mass-based separation, with less massive particles allowing to the detector first, followed by more massive particles. The inlet and outlet flows pass through a floating O-ring connection, so there is constant flow in and out of the channel, just like in the case of AF4. Here is a picture of post-NOVA centrifugal FFF system CF2000 and its specifications. The system has a mass resolution of 5 to 10%. The minimum size limit in centrifugal FFF is material dependent and is 7 nanometer in diameter for gold nanoparticles with a density of 19.3 gram per mil. For biological nanoparticles having density range of 102 to 1.36 gram per mil, the minimum size limit is 28 to 73 nanometer. In centrifugal FFF, retention time, TR, is related directly to analyte point mass using a simple equation. We use this equation later in the presentation to measure mass and density of liposomes. The last subtype of FFF I will discuss here was actually the first type to be invented, called thermal FFF. This type of FFF is most commonly used for separation of polymers in organic solvents and separates by normal diffusion and thermal diffusion the latter of which is related to both size and chemical composition. In many cases, this allows the separation of two materials which have the same size but different chemistry. To summarize the major subtypes of FFF, there is flow FFF for size separation, electric flow FFF for simultaneous size separation and surface charge determination, centrifugal FFF for mass separation and thermal FFF for separation by thermal diffusivity and chemical structure. As I mentioned previously, you can couple a wide variety of detectors to FFF, depending on the desired measuring. Here we see some graphic representations of the more commonly used detectors, multi-angle light scattering or MALS for measuring radius of duration and molecular weight, dynamic light scattering or DLS for measuring either dynamic size, viscometry for measuring intrinsic viscosity and polymer branching, and concentration detectors such as refractive index or UVVIS. ICPMS for elemental analysis is a powerful detector for FFF as well. The first application I will discuss 
is on characterization of Dr. Rubusen by electrical asymmetrical flow fitful fractionation coupled with multi angle light scattering. In this application, the EAF4 MALS is utilized to measure two important physical chemical properties size distribution and surface charge of a commercial liposomal doxorubicin formulation. Doxorubicin is a well-established chemotherapeutic agent frequently used in cancer treatment. Already in 1995, Doxel, the brand name of the first liposomal doxorubicin formulation, became the very first FDA-approved nanodrug. Encapsulation of doxorubicin is a very useful way to mitigate its cardiotoxicity and to ensure a high, stable dose as well as a prolonged circulation time of the drug in the human body. Today, several liposomal doxorubicin formulations are available for clinical application and the accurate characterization of their physical chemical properties including size distribution shape and physical chemical stability is a prerequisite for market approval eaf2000 Post-NOVA Electrical Asymmetrical Flow FFF System and Post-NOVA 21 Angle Moles Detector were used to characterize a doxorubicin sample. The running buffer was a 3 millimolar sodium chloride at pH of 7.3 and a 20 microliter sample volume was used for the analysis. At least three year four runs at different electrical fields are required to measure the electrophoretic mobility and zeta potential of a sample. After performing the experiments, the data files are processed by the EF4 software. The flowchart here explains the steps involved in the calculations carried out by the software. For the calculations, a plot of drift velocity against electrical field is created. The plot is a straight line with a slope equals to samples electrophoretic mobility and sample zeta potential can then be derived from its electrophoretic mobility. EAF4 experiments were performed using a 0.5 millimolar sodium chloride solution at three different applied electrical currents. In the experiments, the bottom plate of the EF4 channel was positively charged. Here in this slide, the response of 90 angle light scattering detector is plotted against retention time at three different electrical fields and constant cross flow rate for the doxorubicin sample. As the electrical field increases, the retention time is shifting to later elution times. The bottom channel wall in these experiments is charged positively, so any shift to later elution suggests that the sample has a negative surface charge. The profiles of radius of duration are also plotted at different applied electrical fields. The sample exhibits a fairly narrow and a stable distribution with a range of 27 to 45 nanometer in radius. Here in this slide, the drift velocity was plotted against the applied electrical field using the data shown in the previous slide. As expected, a straight line with a negative slope can be obtained for the doxorubicin sample. The data suggests is at a potential of minus 34 millivolts for the doxorubicin sample. Today's second application is on studying aggregation behavior of two adeno-associated viruses. 
we will demonstrate in this application how asymmetric flow FFF or AFO coupled to a multi-angle light scattering detector could study the aggregation behavior of two AAV stereotypes when they are exposed to heat. Adeno-associated viruses or AAVs are small protein capsids with an average diameter of 25 nanometer containing a single stranded DNA. AAVs have been used for gene therapy. One of the biggest concerns for manufacturing a uniform AAV product is the presence of viral aggregates. AAV aggregates can create problems with transduction efficiency, biodistribution, and immunogenicity. Due to their large size, often over 100 nanometer in diameter, AAV aggregates are challenging to separate and characterize by traditional column-based chromatography techniques. Data presented in this application demonstrates how AF4 models can study the formation of AAV aggregates into AAV stereotypes when they are exposed to heat. Here are the system components used in this study. PostNova asymmetrical flow FFF, PostNova 21 angle models detector, and a UV vis DAD detector were used. The carrier solution was a formulation buffer, which was 1x PBS, plus a very low amount of pleuronic surfactant. The sample injection volume was 50 microliter. Two AAV serotypes, AAV1 and AAV5, were studied. They were diluted five times using the formulation buffer prior to the analysis. To induce aggregation, the diluted AAV samples were incubated at 60 and 75 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Figures A and B show plots of UV signal versus retention time for non-stress and stress AV1 and AV5 stereotypes. The numbered peaks in the graphs are the subpopulations present in the samples which were separated based on their hydrodynamic sizes. Eluting first are the smaller viral fragments, peaks 1 and 2, followed by the virus monomer, peak 3, and oligomer, peak 4. Peak 5 contains the larger virus aggregates that elute latest in the separation, which are only detected for the stressed AAV1 sample at 75C. For non-stress AV1, monomeric and oligomeric viral particles constitute about 26% and 7% of the sample, respectively. The non-stress AV5 sample contain more monomer than AV1, with 43% in the monomeric and 5% in the oligomeric forms. The data indicates both stereotypes are reasonably stable up to 60 degrees C. However, they exhibited a significant change in their size distributions when they were stressed at 75 C. In both stress samples, the monomer vanished completely. The oligomer peak grew substantially, which is 66% for AV1 and 26% for AV5. This suggests that the virus particles form oligomers as they undergo heat stress. Here are the RG profiles 
represented by black circles for non-stress and stress AV1 and AV5 samples. Each point represents a size measurement for a volume of sample passing through the mall's flow cell. On average, virus monomers, peak 3, are in the order of 8 to 10 nanometer in radius. The oligomer peak, peak 4, varies from 10 to 30 nanometer in radius. The larger aggregates, peak 5, only present in the stress AV1 sample are about 100 nanometer in radius and represents approximately 2% of the population. Our third application today is on density measurements of liposomes using centrifugal FFF and moles. In this application, we demonstrate that by hyphenating two analytical techniques, liposome density can be measured in a single run. Liposomes are the most common and well characterized drug delivery systems. They have been used to stabilize therapeutics, facilitate cellular and tissue uptake, and improve distribution of drug compounds to target sites. They are spherical in shape, with an aqueous core, and a shell made of phospholipid bilayers. Here is the list of system components used in this analysis. PostNova CF2000 centrifugal FFF system was interfaced with 21 angle moles to measure the density of the liposome sample. The running buffer was 1x PBS and 20 microliter of the sample was used in the analysis. This chart explains how liposome density can be calculated from the data obtained by CFFF MALS analysis. Liposome buoyant mass is directly proportional to retention time TR and can be calculated from a simple FFF equation. Liposome buoyant mass can be converted into liposome mass using Archimedes principle if its volume is given. Its volume can be calculated from radius of duration measured by MALS and its spherical shell structure. Liposome density is then the ratio of its mass m to its volume v. Here in this slide, the data obtained from CF3 MALS analysis of two consecutive injections of the liposome sample are shown. The lines represent the response of the 90 angle MALS which correlate directly to the liposome effective mass distribution. The sharp peak eluting between two and three minutes is called the void peak and composed of non-retained sampled species eluting at the beginning of the separation. The broader peak eluting from four to 25 minutes is the main liposome population the dots plotted across the main liposome population represent the radius of duration, or RG. They vary from 44 nanometer to 53 nanometer across the main population, indicating a narrow size distribution for the liposome particles. Liposome has a spherical shell structure and its geometrical radius can be calculated from the radius of duration. Graph here shows the size distribution of the liposome sample for two replicates. The liposome population 
has a mean radius of 57 nanometer. And from this data, we can then estimate liposome volume and use it to estimate its mass and density in the next two slides. This slide shows the profile of liposome mass across its distribution, represented here by solid dots. The liposome population has a mass range of 660 autogram to 1100 autogram, with an average or peak maximum mass of 760 autogram. So in average, a single liposome has a mass of 760 autogram or 760 times 10 to the minus 18 grams. Combining the data shown in previous slides, liposome density now can be obtained as a function of retention time, represented here in this graph by solid dots. Liposome density changes slightly across the population, just about 2.5%, with a peak density of 1.01 gram per, cent per cubic centimeter. Now we will actually use the same methodology in the next application to a more complex sample, a protein-loaded liposome. As it was mentioned in previous application, centrifugal FFF is a mass separation technique that separates analytes based on their masses. Now in this uh, last application, this unique capability of centrifugal FFF is demonstrated to measure mass of loaded protein in liposomes. The liposome in this study is porphysome. Porphysome is a self-assembled porphyrin bilayers. Porphysome are used in therapy and imaging applications. Porphysome has an average diameter of 130 nanometer. The porphyrin bilayer is about 5 nanometer thick. Here is a list of uh, system components used in this analysis. Like the previous application, CF2000 centrifugal FFF system was hyphenated with our mole detector to do the analysis for this sample. Again, the PBS buffer was our running carrier and the injection volume used in this analysis was 20 microliter. Empty and field porphysome samples were analyzed in this application by centrifugal FFF system hyphenated with online MALS and UV detectors. In this slide, the response of UV detector and measured radius of duration or RMS radius as a function of retention time are shown. The red and black lines represent the UV signal and red and black solid circles represent the radius of duration for the empty and field porphysomes, respectively. The sharp narrow peak, eluting at 2.5 minutes, is the void peak representing the elution of non-retained small sample components. The broader peak eluting later is porphysome with a peak maximum at about 11 minutes. Due to its heavier mass, the field porphysome is shifted to a later elution time with a peak maximum at about 19 minutes. This difference in peak retention time is directly proportional to the average mass of protein encapsulated by the porphysome. Similarly, a positive shift in peak radius of duration is also observed for empty 
and feel porphyrosomes. Retention time in CFFF is proportional to particle mass and can be calculated using FFF theory and model size analysis. So, a CFFF fractogram can be converted to a particle mass distribution, and this is what is plotted here in this slide for empty and filled porphyrosomes. In average, empty porphyrosome has a mass of 550 atogram, and filled porphyrosome has a mass of 565 atogram. The mass of loaded protein, here in this study, human serum albumin, is basically mass of field porphyrosome minus mass of empty porphyrosome. Number of human serum albumin or HSA per porphyrosome can be as easily estimated from the total HSA mass per porphyrosome. CFFF measures the total loaded mass of HSA as 15 atogram or 15 times 10 to the minus 18 gram. The total number of HSA molecules per porphyrosome is total mass divided by mass of one HSA molecule, which is 150 for this particular sample. Hopefully, I have been successful in this webinar to demonstrate to you that field flow fractionation is a useful tool for characterization of different drug delivery systems. It was shown that electrical asymmetrical flow FFF interface with multi-angle light scattering detector can be a powerful separation technique to measure both size and surface charge of doxorubicin in the course of few runs. The technique can be also applied to different serotypes of adeno-associated viruses to study their aggregation behavior when they are exposed to heat. Mass and density measurement of liposomes can be studied by using centrifugal FFF, where the separation field is centrifugal. Centrifugal FFF coupled to multi-angle light scattering can measure liposome density by measuring its mass and size simultaneously in a single run. Centrifugal FFF can be used as a very sensitive balance to measure the mass difference between empty and filled liposomes. This concludes our webinar on the principal and drug delivery applications of FFF. Thank you very much for joining us. Please visit postnova.com for application notes, information about our FFF systems and detectors, and contact information for your region. If you are in North America, please contact me directly at sohail.tajiki at postnova.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Dr. Tajiki, for that informative presentation. It's now time for the question and answer period, so I would just like to remind everyone in the audience that if you would like to submit a question, you can do that by typing it in the Q&A box, and you can find that on the right-hand side of your presentation window. So I see we have some questions that have been coming in already, so let's get started. So here's the first one. Can FFF be used in a good manufacturing practice, GMP, environment? That's a great question. Um, I, I didn't cover this in the talk, but uh, we do offer a version of uh, the FFF control software, which is compliant with uh, 21 CFR Part 11. So this uh, includes logins for multiple users, data audit trail, and data protection to ensure uh, data integrity. Excellent. So this next question is a little bit long, so bear with me. We're interested in FFF for virus and antibody aggregate studies. We've been using column chromatography for this, but worry that we're losing aggregate during filtration for sample prep. Do you need to pre-filter samples before running them on FFF the way you do with column chromatography? Uh, the answer is no. Um, usually we don't actually do filtration. So if you have a, a ton of large aggregates that you can see by the naked eye, probably uh, you want to you know, filter at least, uh, let those settle you know, down to avoid injecting them into your system. But in general, FFF is much more forgiving than side exclusion chromatography. 
You know, that's because FFF's open channel architecture. Um, samples that could likely get stuck on the column, uh, for example, large viral aggregates, are still easily handled by FFF. So in addition to um, that, and also the additional size information provided by FFF, uh, the ease of sample prep or often total lack of sample prep is an attractive feature of FFF. Thank you. Have you done any similar studies on other types of VLPs or other viruses? Yes, uh, we have done studies on adeno-associated viruses, adenoviruses, lentiviruses, and lambda-phage virus particles. Um, the separation in AF4 is independent of sample type and can be applied to a wide range of sample size and types. How much mass difference is needed to separate empty and loaded porphysomes in CF3? The resolution in CF3 um, depends on uh, porphysomes' uh, diameter and density. Uh, but for this particular sample, I think the difference uh, should be at least around 10 autogram, or roughly 20% of the empty porphysome mass. What's the advantage of electrical asymmetrical flow FFF over batch zeta potential measurements? That's a very good question. Um, the electrical asymmetrical flow FFF is a better technique when the sample is polydispersed or has a you know, multimodal size or even surface charge distribution. The batch measurements provide an average of the potential for the sample. You know, whereas in electrical flow FFF, the sample can be separated into size fractions and then the surface charge measurement can be performed you know, separately on each peak. In this way, you know, we can study particle surface charge as a function of size. Thank you. Is the flow FFF system compatible with a disposable channel? This person says, I ask because we frequently work with biohazard samples, and I prefer not to open the AF4 channel to change the membrane. Yes, um, we have disposable hollow fiber channels available for our uh, flow FFF systems. Um, it is very easy to switch from the standard channel to a hollow fiber channel. It is just a matter of replacing the cartridges with no extra hardware needed. And, and this eliminates the need to change the membrane as is required for the standard channel. Great. Let's get in one last question. Can an FFF system be disinfected after running a virus sample? Yes, uh, this is possible. You know, we do have customers who have cleaned their system with 10% uh, bleach solution. Um, this would be a perfect option for people who wish to use the disposable hollow fiber channel so they can dispose of the cartridge after disinfecting the system. Well, with that, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Dr. Tajiki, thank you very much again for your talk today and for answering all this audience questions. I also want to thank everyone in the audience for attending and participating in today's event. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, PostNova Analytics, for making today's webcast possible. You'll receive an email alerting you when this webcast is available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who might have missed today's live event. We hope to see you all next time. Goodbye.